Hi, this is Don Forsyth. We're talking about productivity in groups. We have already discussed social facilitation, the, the gain in performance that occurs when individuals work on relatively simple tasks in the presence of others. And we've also talked about social loafing, the loss of social motivation that occurs when individuals are supposed to be exerting maximum effort in groups, but in fact engage in free riding and don't work as hard as they possibly could, um, resulting in the often heard expression, many hands make light the group. But groups perform a, a, a vast assortment of, of kinds of tasks, um, and different tasks require that group members combine themselves in, in different ways. Uh, a jury, for example, um, working, collaborating, discussing a case and trying to make a decision about guilt or innocence is making a, a single decision. And it's possible that the one individual in that group can make the decision and ask the rest of the group to go along with that decision. It's very different if a group, for example, is uh, working on shoveling uh, snow um, in a driveway. Um, six people all with snow shovels, all trying to combine their individual shoveling into a clear driveway or performing a very different sort of task. Their individual inputs are still combined, but in a different way than a jury's inputs are combined. And contrast that with a third kind of group, for example, uh, one trying to climb uh, Mount Everest, uh, in which each group member is linked by ropes to another group member and uh, a very skilled climber can only climb as quickly as the least skilled climber within the group. Um, so different tasks require the group members uh, inputs be combined in very different ways and, and it's the task itself that requires that combination rather, in, rather than the decision by the group members to enact some sort of group decision making process. This aspect of groups is nicely described by Ivan Steiner in his theory of group product. Activity. Uh, he describes the qualities of the task um, that demand certain types of combination strategies as task demands. And he differentiates between tasks that require variations in divisibility, quality, and interdependence. And so his three basic questions are, can the task be broken down into subtasks? Uh, for example, a, a group a learning team in a classroom working on a group paper. Oftentimes the students might just split that paper up into five different parts and each student in the group will be asked to do one of the parts. So some tasks, however, can't be broken down into parts. Um, mountain climbers tied together climbing a mountain can't divide up their tasks. Second question has to do with quality of performance. Is quantity produced more important than quality of the performance? Um, most groups are working on tasks that require a bit of both. Um, so for example, a baseball team performing to, to win the game, the, the team has to produce uh, more runs than the other team. But quality is also critical as well. They have to uh, play the, the game so that they make few errors. Um, so play at a high level of quality to prevent the other team from generating a higher quantity of runs. And lastly is interdependence. Um, how are the individual inputs combined to yield a, a group product? Can they be simply summed together, for example? Or is the combination rule um, more elaborate than that? And in describing the interdependence of group members, Steiner identifies these five different kinds of tasks and combinations. So to review, divisibility, can the task be broken down into subtasks? If it's a divisible task, yes. If it's a unitary task, no, there are no subcomponents. Um, quantity versus quality, is quantity produced more important? If it's a maximizing task, yes, we want to produce the most product possible. Optimizing is no, we want the correct decision rather than the most decisions. And interdependence, how are individual inputs combined to yield a group product? And our types of tasks are additive, individual inputs are added together, compensatory, averaging individual decisions together, disjunctive, 
this is usually a right wrong kind of a problem right wrong yes no um, multiple choice kind of problem where only one answer is correct conjunctive all the group members must contribute to the product before it is completed eating a mountain climbing a mountain um, Paul bears carrying a casket that's a conjunctive task um, discretionary uh, the requirements of the task are not so clear that it requires any of these other uh, combination approaches we'll go through each one of these quickly additive tasks as we have discovered in our analysis of social facilitation and social loafing, social loafing in particular, um, groups do well at additive tasks simply because there are more people to perform the additive task. So four people shoveling a snow on a sidewalk will be able to shovel more snow than one individual, but four times as much snow? Probably not. Um, so as the group increases in size, you'll see a gradual reduction in um, actual performance relative to potential performance. But still, a group of 10 will clearly outperform a group with fewer individuals within it just because there's more individuals to do the work. Compensatory tasks are particularly interesting ones. Um, it's where the individuals make a decision independently of other group members. And then the decisions are simply averaged together. Uh, in my line of work, for example, it's often the case where an uh, individual might be interviewed. Um, a, a new colleague comes to campus and four different individuals are interviewed. And oftentimes the decision is made by a face-to-face -face faculty meeting where people discuss their preferences. But an alternative comp approach would be to make this a compensatory task. Whereas prior to any faculty meeting, in fact, prior to any discussion uh, among the group members, everyone ranks the candidates, evaluates the candidates independently. And then the decision is made simply by, by combining mathematically those individual independent judgments. And oftentimes the crowd's judgment, the average of the group member's decision is actually quite accurate. And that's referred to as the wisdom of the crowds. The story goes that this can be traced back to the legendary 19th century scholar Francis Galton, who is very much surprised by the wisdom of crowds. Uh, supposedly at a county fair, um, there was a contest being run in which uh, people who attended the fair were given the opportunity to guess the weight of an ox and Galton was interested in this process and so he collected all of the judgments and simply averaged them together to see if the crowd all the people who guessed were actually fairly accurate and he discovered that yes indeed they were quite accurate in fact more accurate than the most accurate individual judge labeling it the wisdom of the crowd effect. And Sierowski has a book recently where he's published how, in some cases, uh, groups of distributed individuals whose decisions are averaged together uh, can result in very accurate decisions. Uh, recent investigation illustrates that that's the case, but it also makes the point that the, uh, the group is wise on easier problems rather than extremely difficult problems. In this particular investigation, um, it was conducted uh, in Germany by Krauss and his colleagues, published in 2011, um, under the description of investigating swarm intelligence. Uh, but it, again, it's it's group performance on compensatory tasks. Uh, they watched, they had individuals, large numbers of individuals, make judgments on easy problems and hard problems. The easy problem was a. a guessing the number of marbles in a particular jar and there are quite a few marbles in the jar and this is not that difficult a task and it turns out their findings suggested that the crowd was quite wise here we have the the group's decision and as you can see groups become more and more accurate as more and more people are added to the group so once we got up to around 80 individuals within the group, the group became quite accurate in its judgment. And that's because extreme and quite inaccurate judgments eliminate each other. So if we're judging the number of, of marbles in a jar or pennies in a jar and the actual number is 562, 
we're going to have some people who say, I think there's only 300, but you'll have some people who say there's a thousand. And so those extreme judgments compensate for each other. And so the result is a fairly accurate judgment. And he, these researchers contrasted it with single individuals who were above average in their estimates and also the top 25% of the group members. So they segmented them into individual categories. And you found that when the group was quite small in size, individuals were more accurate. Even just the slightly the above average, in other words, um, more than 50% correct in their average, they were superior to the group. But once the group reached about 10 in size, even a small group of 10 was wiser than an above average single member. And then you had the best perform individual performers. They still outpaced the group, but they lost their their edge once the group became about 40 or more and then the group became better as well so here we have a nice example of the wisdom of the crowd when working on an easy problem they asked the group a very difficult problem as well it had to do with probabilities people have a difficult time estimating probabilities the people in this particular study had a very difficult time estimating probabilities there were a few statisticians in the crowd who got the question right but there were a lot more people in the crowd who didn't have any idea what the right answer was, and they had wildly incorrect answers to this probability problem, and as a result, the crowd never got wise on the difficult problem. Um, so you can see that uh, they performed actually quite poorly compared to the above average group members in the top 25% who actually understood probability. Uh, the group did poorly in adding more and more members to the group when the problem was extremely difficult never resulted in a wise crowd. And that's the unique effect that you find on increases in group size on difficult and easy problems in compensatory tasks. Disjunctive tasks are yes-no problems, right-wrong problems, just a single solution must be must be selected by the group. Again, the, the jury making a decision of guilt or innocent is the classic example of a disjunctive uh, task. The group must select among all the group members the one answer that will represent the group solution. Um, there's a couple of tendencies which occur uh, on these kinds of problems. Um, if it's an intellective task, which apparently the group member believes has a known solution, that there's a correct solution rather than simply a value task or a judgment task, an opinion-based task. Groups generally do better on intellective tasks rather than judgmental tasks. But in general, for the group to, to, to settle on the correct answer, there needs to be someone in the group who knows the right answer. Despite our profound belief in synergy, the idea that a group of individuals who don't know the correct answer will, through discussion, be able to find the correct answer. In most cases, we need to have at least one individual in the group when working on a disjunctive task who knows the right answer. And in many cases, that person, just by simply stating the correct answer, will, will be supported by the rest of the group members who will recognize, well, that's the right answer and accept it as the group solution. Sometimes that's described as a eureka problem because it's so clear to the other group members that the knowledgeable member's answer is the correct one. Unfortunately, groups also frequently work on non-Eureka problems. So even though someone in the group knows the right answer and they announce it to the group, the rest of the group is unconvinced. And they therefore select the incorrect answer uh, because the correct answer um, did, did not immediately appeal to them. This would be the case where uh, a group of students is working collaboratively on a multiple choice question and someone in the group knows the answer is E and says, I believe it's E, but they can't really explain why the answer is E. It lacks sufficient evidence to support their viewpoint and no one else in the group thinks the answer is E, so truth is not supported. And truth should be supported on Eureka problems for truth to win. Conjunctive problems are fascinating uh, examples of combining inputs because all the group members must perform in some way in order for the group to be successful. Groups generally perform poorly on conjunctive tasks or at least at the level of the poorest performing member. 
um, the weakest link within the group. So the, again, the example would be climbing a mountain. If you you must, if you are all lashed together for safety, and someone is climbing quite slowly, uh, then you must move at their pace. Uh, they may try to improve their performance a, a bit. Um, and that's what we we find in some cases, and that and that tendency for the poorest performing member to improve his or her performance to keep up with the others is known as the curler effect. Um, but in general, uh, groups don't perform all that well on such tasks. Um, Norb Kerr has has conducted a series of studies of the curler effect and has identified when it's more likely to occur and less likely to occur. Discretionary tasks um, are ones when groups work on problems which um, are not, it's not clear how the members' inputs can be combined. Uh, the group could treat it as an additive task or a disjunctive task or even a conjunctive task, uh, but the task does not demand any particular kind uh, of combin combinatorial rule. And in which case, uh, the decision made by the group on how to combine inputs is, is, is extremely critical. Um, for all these tasks, uh, the, the groups can succeed, they can fail. It depends on whether or not uh, they minimize group losses, process loss was within their group. But there's also the, the hope for process gains. Um, the idea that the group members are able to increase their performance by working together with others. Um, to go back to Steiner's law, if you recall, it was actual productivity is equal to potential productivity minus process loss. Steiner himself was uncertain about whether or not process gain ever occurs. Uh, sometimes process gain is, is described as synergy. Um, that, for example, a group working on a disjunctive problem, will they be able to get it correct if no one in the group knows the correct answer? Unlikely. And researchers have had a difficult time documenting cases of strong synergy, um, where the group members are able to produce an outcome which was unpredicted based on the skills, the characteristics, the knowledge of each individual group member. So it is quite rare. We can wrap up this analysis by turning to a very specific case where we hope for synergy, which is group creativity and brainstorming. Brainstorming was a, an idea in which investigators thought that we could exploit the special creative talents of groups to come up with new ideas, creative solutions to old problems. It was developed by advertising executives looking for new ways to describe products. And the idea was that a group of people will be more creative than single individuals. There are some rules to brainstorming which should always be addressed and, and always implemented in any brainstorming group. And those rules are be expressive, postpone evaluation, seek quantity, and piggyback ideas. So you are supposed to deliberately talk about others' ideas and extend them if possible. There should be a clear and open sharing of all ideas. And the idea is if you follow those rules, then your group will be quite co quite creative. The difficulty is there's a number of negative process loss variables which undermine productivity and brainstorming groups including social loafing. Once the group gets going and they generate a half a dozen to a dozen ideas, group members no longer exert maximum effort. There's production blocking when one person is talking, no one else can be talking as well. There's social matching. Most people are want to be as productive as, as other people within the group. And if the group sets on a relatively low standard of productivity, they won't be particularly creative. And then there's always the illusion of productivity groups during brainstorming sessions because they like the interpersonal process um, that takes place in the group. They feel as though they're quite productive, even though they're not productive at all. To the point that if you took four individuals and had them sit in a room, each one in their own room, and gave them the rules of brainstorming. Please generate ideas and be as expressive in generating your ideas and don't evaluate your ideas and seek quantity as much as possible and try to link together your ideas so one idea expands the other. If you give them these same rules, even though they're working individually, uh, they'll generate um, more 
creative, more ideas and more creative ideas than a group of four people working in a face-to-face -face brainstorming session. Um, so the promise of, of group-level brainstorming is uh, a relatively empty one. There are alternatives, though, which you can turn to to maximize creativity in groups, and that includes brain writing, where ideas are written, synectics, which is a very advanced uh, leader-centered approach to brainstorming, the nominal group technique, uh, you, brainstorming in electronic um, in an electronic group where individuals are online rather than face to face, and Delphi and Buzz groups, which are all described in more detail in your text. That pretty much wraps up our analysis of group performance. Um, we move on next to questions of group decision making. And then we'll turn to team performance. Thank you, as always, for joining me.